God didn't create the scope and sequence or our state standards. Yeah. God didn't write about any of those things in the Bible. Right. So we need to free ourselves from those things. We, as the homeschooling parent, get to decide what is our child going to learn. Hey, everyone. This is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast and welcome to our homeschool survival series. I'm so excited about this series and God is doing great things through this. I know that more and more parents are bringing their kids home and they're like, what do I do? How do I homeschool? What are my options? And so we are here with a wonderful guest today. Her name is Melissa Crabtree, and we are going to talk about unit studies. But before we get to that, I would like to thank our sponsor, CTC Math. They are a fantastic online math program. If you guys are looking for something to do with your kids for math so that you don't have to teach it yourself, or you can teach it alongside of CTC and and work through it with them if that um, is something that you enjoy doing or something that your kids need, you can totally do that as well. Uh, But you can Try it out for free if you've not yet done so. Go to ctcmath.com. You will not be disappointed. Um, Melissa, welcome to the Schoolhouse Rock podcast. I am super excited to have you with me this week. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to share with these parents. Surviving homeschooling is a good goal. (laughs) It is a very good goal. And I think one that most parents are like, what in the world are we going to get through another day? I know, Um, right? But there are so many of us who live to tell about it. So it must be possible. Yes, yes. Well, you have lived through many years of homeschooling. So tell us really quickly about you and your family. So now I have a 19-year-old son and a 15-year-old daughter. So our 19-year-old son, we started homeschooling. He was four and a really early reader. So we started, uh, I finally thought, well, I might as well start calling this kindergarten um, because we were doing a lot of schooly stuff because he loves to read. And so now I guess I've been homeschooling 14, 15 years. So we have a couple more years left with our daughter. I have a husband. We live in Oklahoma. He works in the oil field. So, and I've, my kids asked me the other day, what was my dream? And it was to be a special ed teacher and then stay home and raise my kids. And I worked that morning. I had a baby that evening and I've stayed (laughs) home and homeschooled my kids. So I'm living my dream. I love it. That's so cool. And you're an Oklahoma, just like me. I am. People here call them Okies, but, um, we call them Oklahomies because we're from California. So we just <laughs> merged the two together. Right. And I've only been here for a couple of years, so, or three, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. I love it. As I remember talking to you about this a few years ago, and I was like, you live where? In Oklahoma? And uh, <laughs> never, ever did I think we would end up here either. But the Lord had different plans, and we love it. It's a beautiful place. You know, as we have have just kind of dissected all the different parts of homeschooling and figured out, like, okay, what are all the different ways that we can homeschool our kids? Unit studies is one that a lot of people are maybe familiar with the term unit studies, but they're not exactly sure what that even means. What is Mm -hmm. a unit study? And it's not something I can speak um, authoritatively on because I've never really done a unit study. I mean, we do a lot of reading, but I've never used those specifically to school my girls through a unit study. And so I was talking to Melissa a few weeks ago and um, she said, well, we did unit studies. We used five in a row. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, yes, you're perfect. Let's bring you on the podcast to talk about it. And so I'm so thankful that you are with me this week to discuss all things unit studies when it comes to homeschooling. So help us first to understand the, like, what are the basic concepts of a unit study? So basically a unit study is when you, you, your content areas, so that would be, so your, your skills areas would be reading and math generally. And Mm -hmm. then some people would put handwriting over there. Um, but then your content areas are science, social studies, or history. Um, your, uh, applied language arts can be content area. Um, so what you do for a unit study is you take one main focus and then your science comes from that main focus and your social studies comes from that main focus. And then your language arts could come from that main focus. So that focus is kind of your theme for Mm -hmm. a week or two or a month or a year, however you decide to do it. And then all of your learning comes from that theme, which brings with it an emotional connection because you end up with lots of memories that go around that theme, the way, you know, the way you typically do a unit study just breeds a lot of memories and together time and loving learning. So sometimes you take a book and all of your, that will be your theme. The book will be your theme and your science will come from that book that you 
um, that you read repeatedly with your kids. So that that book, it kind of develops. I mean, you know, you're sitting on the couch reading with your kids before bedtime, and then you take your learning from that time. So your science topic would come from something that was in that that children's book or picture book, or you could do a chapter book. And then your history would be a topic that you have pulled out of that book that you're reading. And then your language arts, you, they could be copying a paragraph from the book. And that would be your language arts or writing a paper about one of the science topics you're learning. Uh, or you could pull it from, say, you wanted to do a unit study on horses, then you would, you would learn, um, you could learn the history of horses. You would learn the science of maybe their 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 structure, their body structure, and their strength. And then maybe you might learn the history of horses in, in America and how the how, how have horses changed industry or how have you know what I'm saying? Things like that. Sure. So you can do it on a topic, or you okay. can do it on a book, or you or a you know a theme. You could do a World War One unit study. You could do courses, you could do a book, you could do a chapter book, and each chapter could be a unit study that you might do for a week or two. Okay, so it sounds to me like with a unit study, one of the most important things is to ask a lot of questions, right? Like as the parent, if you're teaching that, you would maybe read a book. And, and we are actually, for our listeners, we're actually going to kind of do a mock unit study with Melissa um, this week. And so you're going to get to see how she kind of walks us through doing that. Um, and I haven't done it yet. So this is new to me as well. But but what as I'm listening to you talk about this, it seems that as the parent, you would ask a lot of questions. So you might read a book about something I think we're going to talk about, Make Way for Ducklings, right? Mm -hmm. So you would read the story and then you would ask questions to your kids about whatever that story was about. Or, you know, if you do a unit study on the Titanic, you might ask questions about the Titanic and where it was and how did it sink and all the things. So is that what makes it more of a unit study? Yeah, I think unit studies generally, you're not generally going to have a prepared worksheet right. or a quiz or so the a concept, a you know, philosophy of education, one philosophy might be of filling filling a bucket. So we might think we're supposed to throw a bunch of learning at our kids and they, mm -hmm. we want them to memorize things. And there's, that's some people's philosophy and they choose to educate that way. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Um, but this would be uh, the opposite or maybe not the complete opposite, but it would be a different philosophy in that it wouldn't necessarily be a list of things we're going to memorize about ducks it would be what did we we're going to learn maybe 10 things about ducks from the different ways we choose to learn and we might remember five of them and if i have three kids they might all remember five different things right and that's okay because they've all learned something different that their brain was prepared to learn at that time when we right. were studying about ducks and uh so it's it's not the we're not focused on a specific set of things that will be remembered or, you know, mastered and sure. then forgotten later. And there's, you know, it's not a quiz sort of thing. It's more of a loving learning, mm -hmm. delving in and, and experiencing exploring it. and sure. experiencing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. What we do at IEW is break through the, the noise of the grammar and the writing prompts. And we say, this is what you do step by step. And I've witnessed it over and over again, both watching Andrew teach and hearing from parents, this is the best writing program. We've made it so easy and made it really affordable. So any mom can teach writing to their children using our course, and we guarantee it. To try three weeks of free lessons, visit IEW.com. We are back with Melissa. Um, so what, as you're looking at unit studies, what are the typical ages that are most fitting for a unit study? The early years are perfect for unit studies because, okay. you know, at those, uh, now I would say you could do a unit study at all ages. College students could do a unit study. Um, high school students, if you're wanting to put, uh, to have a created transcript that looks like a college prep transcript, it would be a lot of work. You know, if you're supposed to have, what is it, a, a hundred or 130 or something hours practicing or developing a skill per credit hour, that mm -hmm. would be very, of course, that's different, you know, state by state. I'm just using that example. 
that would be really hard to pull out of a unit study and have it fit in your transcript. Lots of parents have done it. I was not that parent. Yeah. <laughs> but you're definitely before the transcript years uh -huh. uh, are all great ages to do it. But especially the younger years, they just are, they're perfect for it because they're so thirsty for all sorts of exploration. Mm -hmm. You aren't as pressured or you definitely should not be as pressured to get all this stuff done and get all that, you know, do they know all of these things because we're running out of time and you're really not if they're in second grade, you know, it's supposed right. to be about loving learning and it's supposed to be about that in high school too. It just looks really different. Um, so the, or uh, the early years are so perfect for it, but I would say until you're writing stuff on a transcript, seventh and eighth grade, you know, they need to be learning some of those things that I would say are a little more formal or they benefit from that. I wouldn't say need to, because everybody does it differently, but sure. It's so sweet for the early years. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, I, I just picture, especially if you're doing like a more of a literature based unit study, like five in a row that you would be sitting with your kids on the couch reading to them. I mean, it's, it is my favorite part of our homeschool day. I love sitting with my yeah. girls and reading to them. I would do it all day, every day, if that's all I could do, you know, I, I, and, and we do, I would say the majority of our day we spend just reading. Um, but of course we still have to do other things, um, mm -hmm. as well, but I love that because I love the, the relationship that it builds with my girls. Um, and just that we get to experience something together. You know, there are mm -hmm. so many times where we talk about, you know, whatever, you know, Little House on the Prairie, um, you know, we'll talk about something that happened through that series and we can all relate to it because we've all read it. Um, and so I love that. So, okay. So it's mostly geared towards or best for the younger years, though it can be used for the later years. Mm -hmm. What, um, what kinds of kids, what types of kids are unit studies best for? I would say it's their, I would say they're best for all kids. Okay. Uh, because you can take your unit study and you shape it for that child. And you might have four different learning styles in four different children and, um, or 10 different learning styles in four different children, and you can shape it for each child. I think it is perfect for children with special needs. Um, it, you can make all of your activities, say we're learning about ducks. Well, I'm just going to pick that one. You might paint a duck as your as the mom is reading a library book about ducks and then your kiddo who needs to be hands-on and doing something or the three-year-old who doesn't like to sit still but if you give him a paintbrush and some yellow paint he can start painting something and that keeps him occupied mm -hmm. um, where your second grader can be drawing with pencil and paper if that's what they're maybe they're learning about how to draw with a pencil or charcoal in their art class and then that's how they might learn or be occupied while mom's reading or your audio auditory kids. Of course, you can read tons and that throws stuff right at your audio kids right away. Um, and then your visual kids, they can be looking at a book. They can be looking at a YouTube video. They can, um, we, we used videos really very sparingly okay, right. more, more so when we had a good library, when we moved to a, a small town that really didn't have a great library, we did use more YouTube videos and I, we didn't enjoy that nearly as much, mm -hmm. but that kiddo was actually one who learned better with all of the stimulation of a video. She wasn't one who did quite as well with the books, but uh, I really was sad. I always prefer books. So um, when we were learning about, we'll just go back to ducks, we would learn as much as possible from books. So we'll talk more about the different subject and kind of how we would do it, but we did as much as possible from from books. And what I really love about unit studies is that you they're not expensive. You can pick any topic and right. go to your library or search uh, Encyclopedia Britannica online. You know, you can get a thirty dollar annual subscription and and then you can search, you know, the encyclopedia within a protected area, learn about all sorts of concepts without having to buy anything. You know, if you have a library card, most states, if you have a tiny town, you can go to a larger library. They'll all usually do interlibrary loan. Right. So many libraries now let you get a book with Hoopla or, you know, some mm -hmm. of those. So there's so much at our disposal now. There's so much information, but it's a great way if you're, if you are needing to limit how much you're spending, um, that's one of the things that really is, is great about unit studies that I actually hadn't thought about talking about today, but it really is a great way to do it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Cause I know so many parents ask that question. I see it all the time of, you know, how, what are some inexpensive, 
um, products that I can use for homeschooling. You know, where do I get free curriculum? And so, yeah, this is a really great way to do this. So how then, how labor intensive is it for mom? Cause I want to talk to the mom who's maybe thinking like, this sounds amazing. This sounds like it would be a great fit for my family, but how does she move forward in doing this? If she's never done a unit study before. I think some of that is a personality thing. Um, I was very happy to not have a lot to show for our unit study. Some moms really feel like they need to have a lot of proof that they learned uh-huh. something. And it's going to be more labor intensive for that mom. Okay. What I would say to that mom is to try and and remove relieve yourself of that pressure because the proof can be your experiences. Mm-hmm. Take a picture of reading, take a picture of feeding the ducks at the duck pond. That can be your proof of learning. If you want to have a lot of worksheets and a half an inch workbook to show that you learned all of these things, you're going to be frustrated because you might not have that. Now, that said, uh, also, some of the moms who want to have a lot of that proof will go on Pinterest and they will look for, they'll find uh, 14 activities on bears and hibernating. And then they will think they're supposed to do 14 activities (laughs) on hibernating to show that they did enough that mom will also feel pressure to make sure she's doing enough. So it doesn't have to be difficult. If you, if what I would encourage in any mom who's starting homeschooling is to say, you have your, this child has their whole lives ahead of them to learn what they need to learn. God didn't create the scope and sequence or our state standards. Yeah. God didn't write about any of those things in the Bible. Right. So we need to free ourselves from those things we as the homeschooling parent get to decide what is our child going to learn. Now, they obviously, every state is different. Some states, we happen to live in one that we are truly free to do whatever we want to in homeschooling. Not all are like that. Right. But um, so I would just want to encourage the mom, you want to love learning with your kid, especially in those younger years. And one thing that I think is important to say to that mom who may have grandma who is questioning you know, what year did World War II happen or who was the 14th president? Well, first of all, I want to say back to that grandma, you tell me who's the 14th president and you tell me 17 and 21 and 27. Do you know them all? Probably not. So first of all, I would say, relieve yourself of that pressure. The Lord has given you the opportunity and the challenge to homeschool. So Mm -hmm. you get to decide what your child is going to learn. And then I would say, whatever they, in relieving yourself of that pressure, all students, all adults, we all have gaps. Yeah. None of us know everything. And students who move all over the country, they definitely have gaps because I mean, I hit mythology so many times, but I managed to get all the way through my public school years without I never learned about the Vietnam War. Hmm. But I learned mythology constantly. I thought, <laughs> oh, again. Because it just happened to be those years and all those different, my dad is in the military. So we had lots of different school systems, but we all have gaps. Some people, we might even have all of this information, every single scope and sequence and state standard. We might all be presented with all that information, but we're not going to remember it all because we remember what is of interest to us or what a teacher chose to present in an interesting manner. So it is okay if your kid doesn't remember everything that your neighbor remembers or that the fourth grader across the street at a private school remembers. So I would say go into it knowing that they are learning. It's not a matter of checking things off a list. It's Mm -hmm. about learning to love learning, love exploring. So all of that said, how labor intensive is it? It's as labor intensive as you choose to make it. The way I did it is on a Sunday afternoon, I would pick the next three or four weeks. And remember, I had a good, I did have a good library system, but even when I didn't, I didn't actually make it any harder on myself. Um, also, I'm a public school teacher. I have a K-12 teaching degree in special ed, and I didn't have any trouble relieving myself of the pressure yeah, good. Um, for performance. Um, so what I would do is I would write down my thing, my list of things that we wanted to learn. I would go to the library or to YouTube and I would find the things that covered the topics that we wanted. And then I would write them down or just put check marks, you know, on my list. This is what I wanted to learn. And then on Monday, 
I would sit there and go, okay, I only have an hour today because we have to go to a doctor's appointment. So we're going to do those things that are a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, we're home all day long. Dad works late. Okay, we're going to do the messy stuff today. And we're going to do art and painting and build some island with Play-Doh or whatever. Wednesday, we've got co-op at 11 o'clock. We have an hour and a half this morning. We're going to do some of those shorter things. That's how I did it. It was mm -hmm. open and go. Um, so like I said, you, it can be as labor intensive as you want it to be or as you choose not to make it. And all of that is going to be based on the pressure or feeling to put on yourself, um, typically to have proof of right. what we're learning. So I would encourage every mom to let it go. And I won't sing the song for you. Right. <laughs> Though you could make that into a unit study. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Oh all sorts goodness. of science in that book. Or so, uh, song. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. We are out of time, but we're going to come back on Wednesday. We're going to continue talking about unit studies. And then Melissa is going to walk us through an actual unit study, which I think will be really helpful for those of you who are trying to figure out like, what does this actually look like practically? So thank you guys for listening. If you've not yet left a review for the podcast, please do so. We continue to get great reviews and it's such a blessing to us. It really helps us to get the word out about the podcast and helps people to find us so that we can encourage them just like we are encouraging you. Thank you guys for being with us today. Have a great afternoon and we'll see you back here on Wednesday. Bye. Well, first of all, I think the quality of education has steadily deteriorated in America. Tell me about your education. You don't mind telling us about. So I was a military kid. I went to a bunch of public schools and I would say my education is pretty me mediocre. My math and science skills are like pretty low probably like based based on I don't know if it's like lower than average but like what's that saying you know I'd say like overwhelmingly meh from your perspective how do you think the public schools in America are doing not great <laughs> um, I think mostly public schools about indoctrination right now I know that standardization the increase in that has caused a lot of teachers to sort of lose their passion I taught um, kindergarten in a traditional public school, and the curriculum with the mandated testing has changed so much. There's really no time for play, socialization. It's just like numbers, alphabet, words, phonics. I have been in situations where parents are trying to help third graders with their homework, and they can't do it because it doesn't make sense. We find that the student will say, well, if I don't do it you know, the way my teacher said, then it doesn't matter if I had the right answer, right. it's wrong. We grow up in a system, typically, that we think that we need somebody up at a blackboard writing it down and us taking, like there's a standard protocol to learning. And I, I, I think that that's stifling. It certainly stifled me when I was in school. Um, I, for one, was a child who was pretty much always just painfully bored in school. I, I just remember most of school was about how to survive this excruciating boredom and staying in one spot and you couldn't work ahead, you couldn't do anything other than what everybody else was doing. For me, real life started when school ended. I did not enjoy learning and I was dissuaded from writing because I was told I was math and science and I did love math and science and now I'm an author. Mm -hmm. So go figure. So what do you think the solution is? <laughs> I don't have any solutions, but it's definitely not going well. And, and, it's, and it's not easy to uh, uh, come up with, here's the one solution. In other, in other words, dear old United States government, they can't legislate and come up with a solution that's universal. No one is really able to change the great titanic of, of institutional education. It is going along its path and it is essentially unturnable and unchangeable. I mean, let's face it, if money could have fixed public education, it would have done so long ago. If the newest iteration of standards could have changed public education. It would have done so long ago. And so we continue to throw things that don't work 
at this great ship of institutional education trying to change what it is and it's not worked and it's not likely to work until it really kind of breaks apart and has to be redesigned. And in the meantime, what's happening, people are, are not waiting for it to sink and break apart. They're jumping off and finding other ways to get where they want to go.